Good morning and welcome to the 2015 State of Texas Children Report release. We are so excited to have you all here uh, on this foggy day. Feels a little bit like Gotham outside, so you know we, we ordered that up for you too. I'm Ann Beeson and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Public Policy Priorities. We believe in a Texas that offers everyone the chance to compete and succeed in life. And we all know that that opportunity has to begin with our kids. So how do we do that? We use data and analysis to advocate for solutions that enable Texans of all backgrounds to reach their full potential. And for 22 years, we have proudly researched and published an annual report on the state of Texas kids. Um, it's produced by our Texas Kids Count Project, which is part of the Annie E. Casey Foundation's National Kids Count Data Project. And we are so grateful to the Annie E. Casey Foundation for supporting this work for so many years and most dearly grateful for our partners at Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas who have sponsored this event here today and supported this work also for many, many years. <clears throat> now this book's theme, you may have noticed, um, has a kind of a superhero thing going on. You may have noticed our cute kids around here on the tables and maybe even a few live superheroes dashing around in the mix. Um, what's that all about? Well. When I was a little girl growing up in Dallas, um, I personally was a big fan of Wonder Woman. And I loved the way she'd wield those like bracelets and kind of, you know, turn around her lasso to kind of protect democracy and fight against evil. As an adult and as a parent now, I know that actually our real superheroes here in Texas and beyond are our parents, our parents. Every single day, they fight for their kids. They, they put food on the table. Many of them are working two and three jobs. You know, they're helping kids with homework, they're, they're caring for kids when they're sick and needy. I mean, parents really are our true superheroes. But if they were enough to solve all of the problems that our kids here in Texas face, Texas would not be ranked as one of the worst states in the country to be a kid. Now, I want to say that one more time, and you're going to hear a lot more detail about it in a minute. Texas is consistently ranked to be one of the worst states to be a child. Now. As a Texan and an advocate and a parent myself, that actually makes me really mad. That makes me mad because I am a competitive Texan and I know you all are too. And we want to make Texas the number one state for kids. Now to do that, we know it's possible. You know, we can, we can have fun with superheroes. We know we all need to be superheroes for Texas kids. But in fact, it's actually smart policy solutions that are going to get us to where we need to go. And you're going to hear a lot more today about that. Um, we need to all work together. Um, leaders just across the street at the Capitol today and, and many days to come during the legislative session are making very big decisions that are going to have lasting effects on our kids. And we need together to dare them to make the smart investments for the next generation to help our Texas kids. Now, I want to just uh, give you a little bit of a roadmap for our gathering today. After just a few opening remarks, um, our wonderful research analyst, uh, Jennifer Lee, is going to come up and present this year's data on Texas kids. And then we're going to have um, a conversation about one uh, issue, one opportunity that we have in the next few months to help Texas kids that has a lot of momentum this year, and that is the opportunity to expand access to pre-K. And we have some terrific featured guests that are going to come up here and have a discussion about that. Now, just a few details before we, uh, before we get, begin. First of all, we encourage you to tweet uh, during this event. Um, we have two different hashtags that you can use. One of them is Kids Count, um, and the other one is Dare Texas. And I would suggest that you use the Kids Count hashtag to take pictures with our superheroes running around and, 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 and tweet about the event, and our Dare Texas hashtag to make your suggestions, to make your dares for how we make Texas the best state for Texas kids. Um, we are uh, also just wanted to mention uh, quickly that uh, for those of you that parked in the garage, um, it's much more convenient and you need to pay for your parking in the hotel if you can, not in the garage. So do that on your way out. Um, I want to acknowledge um, just a few um, uh, uh, of our elected um, and appointed leaders that are here in the room with us, and I'm sure I'm probably going to miss a few more, but I just wanted to um, first, of course, acknowledge Chairman Deschatel, who's going to be with us and 
the conversation about pre-K, um, Representative Jessica Farrar uh, and Senator Royce West. And I think we also have Judge Darlene Byrne here. So thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I want to thank uh, Methodist Health. Yes. <clears throat> I want to thank the Casey Foundation again and also Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas and invite up Kevin Moriarty, uh, the president and CEO of, of MHM, who's going to offer a few marks before we begin. Thank you so much, Kevin. <clears throat> So as soon as I stood up, this thing fell out, so don't know what I'm going to do with it. I'm glad to be here today. i um, been involved and engaged with the Texas Kids Count Project since inception. Uh, back then, I was a public official uh, working on health care, working on Head Start. I ran the Head Start program in the southern sector of the state through PCI. I ran the daycare sites, uh, worked on pre-K, uh, and made sure these services were available to kids. And I have a similar story to Anne. Uh, it always depressed me uh, that Texas was always listed in Health and Human Services as being the worst. And, you know, except for Arkansas and Missouri, we would have been the worst in the nation in everything, and occasionally we beat them out. Uh, and that's a pretty terrible thing to do. And I remember as a young man uh, with a family of four children uh, how I was making sure my children had pre-K. Uh, all my kids went to pre-K. All my children went to public schools initially. Uh, and it was the head start that helped them achieve uh, and be great at what they did. And I remember being asked, uh, as a public official, I was on the steps of City Hall. Uh, we had a great deal of furor over an issue with associated with children. Uh, and I was asked about where in San Antonio or Texas I would refer a family of a handicapped child so that child would, would receive services through a daycare center or for somewhere else, and they would be able to achieve and succeed. Uh, and I remember my response because the next day it was the front page of USA Today, uh, and my bosses were rather upset with what I said, uh, because what I said at the time was that child's parents should move them to California, Illinois, and New York, because Texas didn't have a positive future for that child. And that child's outcomes would be worse if they stayed in Texas because there were no services available. I remember the fight for the Children's Health Insurance Program in Texas. Uh, I moved from the public career where I handled health and human services to Methodist Healthcare Ministries. Methodist Healthcare Ministries owns the Methodist hospitals, and we receive our revenue from there. And so we put about $75 million a year into nonprofits to work on issues of health care. Uh, but Methodist Healthcare puts 12,000 babies a year uh, into our community. And I think the report several years ago indicated that you know, a lot of births <laughs> for the United States were occurring in Texas. And so where is this growing economy? Where are these families? Where are these children that are coming into Texas? And where are they being taken care of? And so we have a great responsibility in this state to create the best education systems, to have available the best health care systems, to have access for handicapped and disabled children to the best services, because they're our economy in the future. They're the way to get us out of the distress that we have everywhere that we have it. And so uh, as a public official, I argued for those types of things. Uh, in the private sector as a nonprofit, I, I don't get slammed by the media too much since I'm no longer a public official and they have to, they have to play by different rules. Uh, but uh, we still stay engaged in these issues. Now, I'm a nonprofit director, so today I'm wearing a red and a blue tie, because as soon as this is over, I I'm on uh, the legislative floor and I'm lobbying. Uh, and we're organized to be able to lobby. Actually, I'm doing public, health edu public education, right? Not lobbying. <laughs> uh, and I would urge all of you, uh, as you listen to these issues, uh, to talk to your public officials, to talk to uh, the people that are making decisions about children's lives, whether it be the school board, whether it be a city council, whether it be a commissioner, whether it be a legislature, and try and move that mark. And I want to say something hopeful. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have made a lot of progress. At the end of the day, my career has spanned about 40 years in health and human services, and we are tremendously better off today than we were then. We have great organizations like CP Cubed out there. The Annie Casey Foundation has provided me over the years a tremendous amount of data to use with people that are, that's irrefutable. 
And that's what I like about it. It's, a, it's by county, it's by area. I take it home, I use it. And when I use it, I get people saying, oh. And then they start saying to themselves, oh, what can we do about it? And so I think it's a great thing that's being done here. I applaud you for all of the work that you do. I thank all of you for being here. Uh, and I know you'll have a wonderfully educated opportunity with Jennifer here pulling all this data together and running you through it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
That includes nutrition and access to healthy food, which is the foundation of good health. And it also includes health insurance, which is the access point to health care in the state. And today in my presentation, I'm going to focus on health insurance. Now here's a truth. Texas is ranked 49th for children with health insurance. You can't be the number one state for kids if you're ranked 49th for children with health insurance. But the good news is, is that we've improved. Kevin mentioned earlier that there have been a lot of improvements in the state. And Texas has actually improved from 18% of its kids being uninsured in 2008 to 13% of kids now. That's a pretty big improvement in a relatively short period of time. And a lot of that improvement has come through strengthening our public health insurance coverage options to children through Medicaid, through the Children's Health Insurance Program. But the troubling news is, is that it seems like progress is slowing down. And one of the ways that we can keep momentum going, the legislature has not taken advantage of the, all the opportunities that are available to it. Part of that slowdown is related to something positive, actually. It's related to the welcome mat effect. And what the welcome effect simply means, welcome mat effect simply means, is that when we insure more parents, we tend to insure more kids. And this is a theme that I'll return to in the presentation, but if we want to do right by Texas kids, we really need to look at the whole family that surrounds them. We need to make sure that Texas is a good place to be a parent for all those hardworking parents in order for Texas to be a good state for kids. The welcome out effect, which is a positive thing, combined with the coverage gap is something that prohibits us from insuring as many kids as we can. Now, how does the coverage gap work? We're going to compare two families, one in the coverage gap and one not. First, we'll start with a, a, fam, a low-income family who's not in the coverage gap. This is a family, two parents, two kids, that makes $24,500 a year. The employer does not offer health insurance, and the parent's income is too high for them to be eligible for Medicaid in Texas. However, their income is just above the poverty line, so that does give the family access to subsidies that help them purchase private health insurance through the health insurance marketplace. And with the help of these subsidies, we went on to healthcare.gov and figured out that these parents could purchase insurance for about $43 a month. Over 12 months, that would be a little over $500 a year, or about 2% of their income. So it would be affordable for this family. And perhaps when this family went to um, a community-based organization to help them get enrolled in health insurance, they found out that their kids were eligible for Medicaid. And they enrolled their kids in Medicaid. That's the welcome out effect. Now a second family making just $1,000 less. $23,500 a year. This family's income puts them just under the poverty line. They still make too much to be eligible for Medicaid in Texas because we still have that gap and Texas did not decide to include these parents in Medicaid in Texas. However, their income is too low to be able to access subsidies. Because they're just under the poverty line, they don't have access to subsidies but their income's still too high for them to be able to access Medicaid. So we went on healthcare.gov and figured out that the monthly premium for this family would be around $440 a month. Now, over the course of a year, that's over $5,000. That's over 20% of their income. What that means is this, these parents are probably going to remain uninsured. And what it also means is that many of our kids who are uninsured live in these types of families. This family has no connection to health insurance. They perhaps have no knowledge or experience about how health insurance works, which, let's face it, is pretty complicated. I mean, I don't think I know how my health insurance works, to be honest. And they might not even know that their kids are eligible for Medicaid. Over half of the 888,000 kids that are uninsured in Texas today are eligible for CHIP or Medicaid, but they may not be aware of this. And 
when we combine, again, when we combine the effects of the welcome mat effect and the coverage gap, what we're really saying is these kids and these families aren't welcome in the state of Texas. We have chosen not to insure their parents, and as a result, we insure fewer kids than we could if we took advantage of all the opportunities available to the state. So in order to make Texas the number one state for kids and move up from 49th in children's health insurance, we dare Texas to close the coverage gap and expand health insurance coverage options for families. Now health is intimately connected to the second topic that I wanna to turn to, which is education. How well are kids educated in Texas? Um, a couple weeks ago, a friend of mine who's a high school teacher posted on Facebook that she was frustrated with teaching, that she was done. Um, she said she was frustrated. She had students in her class who couldn't see the board and their parents couldn't afford to get them glasses. She had students who had severe anxiety problems that were affecting their schoolwork in the class. And, you know, then she, and then she posted that she realized she wasn't really frustrated with education. She was frustrated with our healthcare system, that her kids weren't healthy and prepared to learn. So there are um, very strong links between health and education for kids. Now, I actually keep um, in my office a truth or dare card that says, I dare Texas to support our public schools to be the best in the nation. And having the number one public schools would go a long way towards making our state the best for kids in the nation. But here's a hard truth. This is a quote from former district court judge John Dietz in his school finance court ruling of last year. And he says, Texas's future depends heavily on whether it meets the constitutional obligation to provide a general diffusion of knowledge. What that means is that Texas's continued prosperity depends on how well we educate our kids. Now, Judge Dietz goes on to say, unfortunately, in recent years, Texas has defaulted on its constitutional promise. Now, when we don't adequately support our public schools, we limit the opportunities of kids in Texas. We limit them. And we also limit the future prosperity of our state. It starts from the very first step, pre-K. We've been hearing a lot about pre-K in the news lately. Um, you'll hear a lot more about pre-K in our panel. Now why, and why is everyone talking about pre-K? Why is pre-K so important? Well, one of the reasons that pre-K is so important is that unfortunately, gaps in opportunities that are available to children, gaps in achievement open up from the very earliest ages. We know that by the time many kids start school in kindergarten, there are still a lot of gaps between low-income kids and non-low-income kids. And kids who start behind, even though they're learning and progressing, they tend to stay behind their other peers. In pre-K, in pre-K, kids learn valuable social and emotional skills that really build the foundation for the rest of their educational careers. They learn skills like motivation, self-confidence, um, perseverance. Those are the foundational skills that encourage further skill development later on and all throughout life. And that's why all the research shows that pre-K has such long-lasting effects. Now, this is from a study done by Texas A&M. And Texas A&M did a cost-benefit analysis of high-quality pre-K in the state of Texas. And they found that for every dollar that you invested in pre-K, if we were going to educate 70% of our Texas four-year-olds in a high-quality pre-K, even with all the costs that that type of program would take, every dollar putting in, we'd see $3.50 in benefits. That's a pretty good rate of return. Um, I don't think even real estate in Austin has that good of a return, <laughs> putting a dollar in and getting $3.50 back. And those benefits, they're they're benefits for the kids, but not only, but for the state also. Kids who are in pre-K, um, they're less likely to be held back later in school. They're less likely to need special education services. 
Uh, they're less likely to have contact with the juvenile justice system, adult criminal justice system, have higher earnings as adults. There are so many benefits to pre-K. Um, and to sum all of that up, I think this quote sums it up beautifully that it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And for policymakers who are listening or anyone who keeps track of the dollars, I would add that it's much less expensive to do that. Now, the pre-K study that Texas A&M did depended on pre-K being of high quality in Texas. And unfortunately, Texas lags. The National Institute of Early Education Research has 10 quality standards that they use to evaluate pre-K quality in the states. And Texas met only two out of those 10 standards. That's the lowest number of standards that any state-funded pre-K program in the country had. The two quality standards that we meet are having early learning standards and providing in-service education for pre-K teachers. But we're missing out on a lot of other critically important standards, such as having a maximum class size limit, um, having a staff teacher ratio, and um, providing, um, even making sure that the teacher has a bachelor's degree and is specially trained to teach four-year-olds. These are standards that we don't have anywhere in our policies. So in order to make Texas the number one state for kids, we dare Texas to improve its pre-K quality standards and expand access, expand pre-K to a full day so that kids can take full advantage of that effect, of all those good effects of pre-K and narrow that gap, narrow that gap so they get off to a good start through the rest of their educational lives. Now the last topic is child poverty and family economic security, and those are two sides of the same coin. Again, what's good for kids, if we want to make the state a good state for kids, we really need to look at what's happening in the whole family. And child poverty is deeply connected to the things that I talked about earlier, to health, to education. Unfortunately, there are very strong connections between poverty and worse outcomes in all of those other areas. Now, truth, one in four Texas kids lives in poverty. Now, poverty means for a parent, two-parent, two-child family living under less than $24,000 a year. It's a pretty low standard. And one in four Texas kids lives under that poverty threshold. When we look at poverty throughout our state, we see that child poverty is pervasive throughout Texas. There are variations geographically, but even in the state that has the lowest child poverty rate, which is Rockwall County outside of Dallas, one in 11 children live in poverty. One in 11 children lives under that $24,000 for a family of four threshold, even in Rockwall County. Now in Travis County, our child poverty rate is lower than the state as a whole. That's a positive thing. 21% of Texas Travis County kids live in poverty, although that's still too high. And when we break this number down to look at children of different races and ethnicities in Travis County in Texas, we again see that child poverty affects kids of all races and ethnicities in Texas, but there are some very troubling disparities. Higher poverty rates for our African American and Hispanic children means that those kids are facing much bigger obstacles in reaching their full potential, in living full, the full prosperous lives that we want for all of our kids. Now, we like to think that poverty and work are connected, but the truth is that having a job in Texas doesn't guarantee that you're not going to experience economic hardship. And this is a very simple comparison and I think illustrates that fact. The parental unemployment rate, so the unemployment rate for parents in Texas is 5%. Yet we have 25% of our kids who live in poverty. There is a disconnect there. There's something that's happening. Texas is actually one of only a handful of states where our parental unemployment rate is better than the national average, but our child poverty rate is worse. 
And when we look at our lowest income working families, Texas is ranked fifth highest for the share of jobs that pay minimum wage or less. Now what do we do about this? Child poverty is a big problem. Um, and why should we care? Now as I mentioned earlier, poverty is related to a lot of the things that everyone in this room cares about. Child poverty is related to worse health outcomes for children. Um, babies who are born into poverty are have a greater likelihood of having developmental delays and disabilities, higher rates of chronic illness, and poverty robs children of their opportunities to reach their full potential. Kids are, who live in poverty are less likely to graduate from high school. They're less la likely to enroll in higher education and complete higher education. They're more likely to live in poverty as adults. There are many reasons to care, and there is a line of new research that shows that the financial, the stress on families and children that financial hardship causes in a very real way harms children and families. Um, the CDC calls these adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and they look at the effects of things like abuse on kids, um, exposure to violence, um, having a parent um, the death of a parent, experiencing the death or incarceration of a parent. But among all of those factors that can potentially traumatize a kid, they included economic hardship. Economic hardship can have lifelong effects on our kids. And the truth is there are many kids and families who have already reached that crisis point. More than 250,000 kids in Texas are living away from their parents. Their families have already reached that crisis point. They're now living with grandparents, aunts and uncles, or relatives because of crisis in their families. That represents 90% of the kids living away, living away from their parents. Um, so these aren't kids in foster care. These are kids who, just because of the tough times going on in their family, are living with their grandparents. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the grandparents and other relatives that take these kids on are often financially insecure themselves. And, you know, they're unprepared to take on the additional cost of raising a child that they weren't expecting. They might be on a fixed income. And there are some programs that are available to help them. But often, grandparents don't know about these programs or the process is very difficult to navigate. And the financial benefit at the end isn't uh, sufficient. So here's just one example. Last year, there is a program that gives a one-time payment to grandparents who are taking care of children. Last year, 648 families accessed that benefit. That's out of 250,000 kids we know who are living away from their parents. And the payment that they received was $1,000, a one-time payment, which helps, but it's not really sufficient if you are taking on the cost of caring a child. Now, what do we do about child poverty and family economic security? These are really big problems. You know, there's, there's no easy answer. I wish there was, because otherwise I think we would have done it already. Um, but there are a couple of small solutions that we can take to ease the financial stress on some of our most vulnerable families. First, we can provide more support for informal care, kinship caregivers, for those grandparents who are taking care of their children. We can help them navigate the system better, and we can increase the benefits so that it's a real help to them. A second suggestion, a second recommendation that we have, is to raise the minimum wage for our lowest income families. Um, now, you may have heard that um, in Santa Fe or Seattle that people have voted to raise their minimum wage, but what a lot of people don't know is that that can never happen in Texas because state law actually prohibits cities from asking their voters to vote on the minimum wage. So a related dare that we have for Texas is to raise that prohibition and allow cities to decide for themselves what should be the minimum that is allowed for a hard day's work in their city. And again, we just say, to make Texas the best state for kids, we really need to look at the whole family and make Texas 
the best state for parents and for the families that surround kids. Now, we all want our kids to be healthy, well-educated, and financially secure, but we've got a lot of work to do. Now, I don't want to leave us on a depressing note. Um, that's why we have the superhero theme. We want to be big and bold. So I want to end, actually, by asking you to think about what you've heard today and just think, is there anything that um, surprised you or that made you mad? Anne said sometimes anger can actually be a good motivator or something that inspired you. And I'd like to ask you now to just um, write something down on your Truth or Dare card. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. And then when you're done, just share with people at your table. Um, these, you're looking for these cards on your table. And I'll put this guy up to remind you to think big. Set a big goal for yourself. This could be a dare that you have for yourself. It could be for your organization. It could be for the state of Texas. And take a few minutes to just think about what you could do to make Texas the best state for kids. Um, and after a couple of minutes, I'll ask for people to share. If you're done, um, please share with your neighbor. Turn and talk, as teachers like to say. All right, if we can, um, do we have any brave, brave, bold superheroes that are willing to share in front of a group? We've got mics. Just raise your hand if you're willing to share your goal for Texas, kids. If no one raises their hand, I will call a name of someone I know. <laughs> Is everyone done? Can everyone hear me? All right, we're going to, if everyone can just quiet down for one second. So that, oh, we have someone. We have a volunteer hey. over here. Thank you. Let's hear. All right. I dare our fiscal conservative lawmakers to brag about the healthy state of our economy in a room full of hungry school children. Oh, can you, that's so great. Can you actually stand up and say that again? I just want to hear it again. <laughs> Can you stand up? I, oh, sure. Yeah, that's I great. dare our fiscally conservative lawmakers to brag about the healthy state of our economy to a room full of hungry school children. That's a great dare. Thank you. 
Um, and we'll ha take one more dare, and then I have one last dare for all of you. I think Sister JT has one over here. Dare to tell our lawmakers to raise the minimum wage statewide. Raising it by, by cities will cause lots of problems too long to enumerate on a dare card. <laughs> Thank you. Um, those are great dares. And um, I just have one last dare, actually, for all of you. And, you know, to make all of the dares that we have on our cards a reality would require a lot of things. It would require leadership. It would require commitment. Um, it requires just placing a greater priority on kids and what they need. But it would also require investment, some of these things that we want. Um, one of the biggest limitations that we have in Texas today is a state budget that doesn't allow us to invest in the things that we want for our kids. And actually, right now at the Capitol, uh, the Senate is hearing public testimony on the amount of money that we have that's available to invest in our kids, to invest in our public schools. So my final dare for you all in this room today is to have that difficult conversation, maybe just with yourself, with your family, um, with your friends, about are we willing to invest in the things that we say that we want for our kids? Are we willing to put our money where our mouths are? And so that's the last dare that I leave you with today. I hope that I've uh, convinced you that investing in kids is the right decision. But if I haven't, then I hope that these kids will. I am the future of Texas. I'm the future of Texas. I am the future of Texas. When I grow up, I want to be an artist. Mm, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a race car driver. A soccer player. A doctor. A volcanologist. I want to be a rock star. I want to help animals that are sick. It's important to go to school because you can get a job. So you can be smart. Because people need to know what one plus one is. You need to learn. You learn things that you need to know for the life ahead of you. I like to learn about how the earth travels. I think math is really important. The water cycle. I like to learn about other people's jobs so I know what job is right for me. When I'm sick, I get tired. I feel like I really can't move. Kids go to the doctor to figure out what's wrong with them so then you don't feel bad anymore. If you're not healthy, it's hard for you to learn in school. It's bad to be hungry because it distracts me and I really want to eat. And you can't think about like learning. It's important to eat the right food to be healthy. It's hard to do your work when you're hungry. It's all connected. That is definitely true. They even made studies about it. Educated kids make a better Texas. Healthy kids make a better Texas. Kids who eat right make a better Texas. Invest in us now for a better Texas tomorrow. And I think we have time for a few questions about the presentation before the panel, um, if anyone has any questions. Or if no one has questions, um, I just have two, um, OK. If no one has questions, I'll just have two announcements. Uh, the first is that if you're interested in the Kids Count Data Center, um, well, um, and learning about accessing more local data on child well-being, uh, look, be on the lookout for an email in your inbox about a Kids Count Data Center webinar that we'll be having in April. I'll walk people through the data center, how to access um, 
you know, lots of child well-being indicators for your county. And the second is that tomorrow uh, there is, is actually Child Protection Day at the Capitol. It's being uh, organized by our friends at Text Protects. So if you're interested in that, you can contact them or just show up tomorrow. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to Ann Beeson, who will introduce our pre-K panel. Thank you. You didn't have your mic up. He's okay. going to come up and get your mic. Come on up, yeah. Thank you so much, Jennifer. She did such a fabulous job with this report and the research. Um, just want to give Jennifer another round of applause for this great work. And I'm going to welcome up our panelists. Um, I think we need to get one more um, mic. Thank you. You all feel far away over there. Hello, these big comfy chairs that they have. I feel like I'm on, you know, PBS or something. Oh, wonderful. That's so great. Thank you so much. Um, well, uh, as you heard from Jennifer, and as we, of course, all knew coming into the room, High quality pre-K is a very smart investment in our state's future and our children's future. And as she noted, what we know is that well-funded, high quality pre-K helps kids prepare for school and substantially shrinks the uh, achievement gap for our low-income kids. It also happens to be linked to many other good outcomes that we care about in this room. Um, kids that uh, have access to pre-K and go to pre-K are healthier. Um, and their parents are more financially secure, and that's, of course, because pre-K serves as a work support for working moms and dads. Um, and yet we know that only 52% of our four-year-olds in Texas are currently in public pre-K. And we have a broad group uh, in this room of researchers, educators, advocates, business leaders, and other uh, elected leaders who are working together to expand access to pre-K. And we are so glad that so many of you who are champions of pre-K are here with us. Um, we have many great organizations represented. And I just wanted to acknowledge a few of them who have put out other uh, terrific research and, uh, and have advocated for expanded pre-K. And they include Texas Impact, the Children's Defense Fund, Raise Your Hand Texas, Texans Care for Children, Children at Risk, and many others um, here. Um, and there's a lot of momentum, and that's why we have this great panel here today on pre-K, this legislative session. Uh, Governor Abbott has made it an emergency item, and, and lawmakers right across the street at the Capitol are currently considering a number of bills. We want to have a conversation today, a very practical and pragmatic conversation, about what experts and business leaders want our leaders to know and want you all to know about pre-K and how all of the stakeholders in this conversation can work effectively um, with our elected leaders to, uh, to get this done. Um, and we also want to talk about what can we learn from the momentum around pre-K that will help us advance other causes for children. Now, I want to welcome a very distinguished panel um, uh, here this morning with us, um, right here on the right, uh, Chairman Deschotel, uh, who has taken time out of his very busy schedule. Thank you so much, Chairman Deschotel, for being with us. Uh, he represents House District, House District uh, 22, which is Port, the Port Arthur area, um, and is a member of the Public Education Committee and the chair of the Land and Resource Management Committee. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Liz Gershoff, who is with the Department of Human Development and Family uh, Sciences at UT Austin. We are so delighted, uh, Liz, to have you with us. Um, and finally, on, the far, on my far right, um, uh, Catherine Morris, who's the General Counsel and Director of Public Affairs for Samsung Austin Semiconductor and is one of our many business leaders who has been a great champion for pre-K and early education. So we are very delighted to have you all with us and uh, hope we can have a good conversation up here this morning about what we can do together. <laughs> so Chairman Deschatel, I'd like to just begin with you and ask, why do you think there is political momentum around pre-K this legislative session? And, and what was the tipping point? You know, what, What's going on that's made this come to the attention of so many of our leaders? Well, you know, I, I can certainly speak to myself and, and how I, I came to, to this point, and it had to do with my work on HB5. Mm -hmm. But I think this has been going on, but 
uh, I was fairly new to the education issue working on HB5. Prior to that, I did mostly economic development mm -hmm. uh, type work in, in business and industry, but it became clear when you talked about economic development that without an educated workforce, we can't have a strong economy. Absolutely. So I, I began working on HB5 and the high school issue and the STARS issue, but thinking about why are kids having issues passing tests and how much money we're spending on that, and it kind of brought me to talk to some middle school principals, and it was mm -hmm. some your organization, a spotlight in the middle, 2014 or 13. And I met with those principals, and they were, they were expressing similar issues and questions and, and mm -hmm. concerns that the high school principals were about the kids they got. So that just brought me down to the beginning. I said, well, obviously the problem, we're not putting resources at the very front end uh, and so that kind of got me very interested in early childhood education <clears throat> and I started doing research and reading and found out uh, uh, the cognitive development of, of very uh, newborns and very small children and how important it was to begin at that point. And if we did, many of our problems at the, at the end would mm -hmm. not exist. Exactly. Remediation in college for, for kids who aren't ready for college, passing tests, all that would go away mm -hmm. if kids had a level playing field to begin with and, and, and learned from the beginning on how to learn. So mm -hmm. I began uh, working with you know, my energies toward that end and that's what kind of got me uh, to this point. But I, 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 think, I think it's work that groups like this does and just cons constant communication mm -hmm. about early childhood education and the importance of it, it started catches on because it's sort of, it's just sort of common sense now that we learn more about how the mind and brain develops mm -hmm. that we begin at a much earlier age as far as the learning process of course at different ages and at one two and three is different than four five and six the way you approach it mm -hmm. but we've had enough research to understand how we should approach it so that these kids would not take away their childhood from them but they would also be able to become better citizens and have a better quality of life and, and a big challenge that I'm finding is, uh, we all probably find, is how do we engage the parents of, er, of very young children to understand the importance of reading to your child and, and having discussions and, and interaction with your child. They just don't understand how important that is. And how do we engage? We can't legislate that. Mm -hmm. So how do we engage that? I think if we could ever do that, uh, it would be a big step. Uh, in, in, in that process, and as, we, as they spoke about the budget just a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. it, you're really, your, your big policy statement on what, what you actually believe is reflected in your budget. Mm -hmm. We can have all the rhetoric that we talk about when we run for election, run for office, and how important education and, and things are, but if we don't put the money there, it's really not that important to us. Mm -hmm. And But I believe there is a movement in the legislature uh, to began doing that mm -hmm. to start putting more money into education and early childhood education so mm -hmm. that's terrific um, and you mentioned that you know seeing the research definitely had a real influence on you and other oh, yeah, lawmakers yeah. Mm -hmm. just wanted to turn to Liz and, and have you share with us Liz you know some of the the big findings around pre-k and why it is so important sure so um, I just wanted to start by saying that we, we do know a lot about pre-K now because we've had many states who have expanded their pre-K programs and have done evaluations of them. So we have a lot that we can learn from other states by now. Um, but I think it does bear repeating a comment that Jennifer made earlier that we know that there is an achievement gap when kids start kindergarten. So we know that's there. That's probably why you're all here. We know that. But pre-K gives us one of the best levers we have for trying to reduce that gap. And so we know that um, the, some of our states nearest to Texas have started big pre-K programs and evaluated them. And so I'll share with you a couple of findings from those states. So New Mexico has a pre-K program. It's not universal, but it is a pre-K program. They evaluated it and found that it had positive impacts on preschoolers' language, literacy, and math skills. Uh, they also did a cost-benefit analysis and found that for every dollar they spent, they saved five dollars, uh, mostly in uh, services that would have otherwise gone for special education or remediation services for kids who had to be held back later on. Um, and so that's pretty exciting. Uh, the Arkansas Better Chance program, which has a cute acronym, ABC, uh, their program was evaluated as well, and they found increases in vocabulary, math skills, and pre-literacy, so pre-reading skills in preschoolers. Again, good foundations for later learning in school. 
Oklahoma has a universal preschool program, pre-K program, which is pretty rare in our country, and it's wonderful. Um, and they've had it for a while now and have done several evaluations. Um, their program is also unique because it's part of the school system. It is not a separate program or run by uh, Health and Human Services. It's run by the State Department of Education, which is key because that means the teachers in the preschool are certified teachers, and they get paid as certified teachers. So that's pretty crucial for increasing quality in preschool programs is having high quality teachers with good education backgrounds. That's pretty key. And so the Oklahoma program has found really consistently strong pro, uh, effects on kids, including uh, letter and word recognition, spelling, and math skills. Um, and what's also important about the Oklahoma program is they found that all kids benefit. It's not just low income kids, um, which is, was found in some other smaller programs. But in Oklahoma, every child benefits, which is pretty important. So a universal approach can be effective. That's often a policy debate about where we should put our dollars. But in Oklahoma, at least they've shown all kids are benefiting from the program. Um, so those are our, our nearby states. But uh, North Carolina also has done a recent evaluation of their program. They have a set of services that go from kind of birth and toddlerhood through preschool. And they found that the more counties spent on early education, the, uh, the more savings they had in special education later on. Um, and so for counties, it was a huge savings uh, for them in their education mm -hmm. system. And they followed kids all the way to third grade to really show that there are these long-term impacts. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also know uh, from a, a smaller uh, pre-K program, but in Boston. Boston has another universal within the city preschool program. And they've done a rigorous evaluation of that program and also found very strong effects um, on kids' language, literacy, and math. And again, that is part of their school system. The teachers are certified teachers. 75% of them have master's degrees. So these are, they're treating preschool like school. It's not, it, it's a, we want to have high quality people interacting with our kids who have good training, are using good curricula uh, to uh, deliver a good program for kids. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that some of the work that I and others have done on the Federal Head Start program have found some long-term effects on kids. And one of the ways that we're finding is that through helping parents, um, and so this gets to a point the chairman just raised, that programs that can help parents teach their own kids at home because kids are still spending more time with their kids than they spend in childcare. Mm -hmm. That's really important. So getting parents involved in preschool, in Head Start, so they can learn how to teach their kids, how important it is to read, how important it is just to talk to kids and expose them to vocabulary. Those are really important things that parents learn from preschool. They see teachers doing it, and so they do it at home. Um, or you can actually explicitly teach parents that. Um, United Way has a great program that I helped evaluate, that Catherine and I were involved in, um, called Play to Learn, that helped teach parents those skills so they could do that at home. Um, so I think if we could have pre-K programs that involve parents as well, mm -hmm. that would kind of be a double, double whammy for a benefit. That's a great suggestion. So, so Catherine, the chairman mentioned that he got interested in pre-K from the perspective of economic development. Tell us a little bit about why businesses are so interested in pre-K. Well, <clears throat> let me tell you my personal uh, journey. Uh, I have to say five years ago, I was probably one of many people who just said, what's this pre-K stuff? Don't mm -hmm. parents teach their kids what they need to know so they go to kindergarten? I mean, and obviously I've learned so much in the past five years about that. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed about the ignorance you know, that, that um, you know, that I was operating under. Um, and so, you know, so what happened in five years? Well, um, a little less than five, well, about five years ago, S Samsung made it, expanded its plant in, in, in Austin, uh, made a, a $4 billion investment to, to, to upgrade its, its plant. And in the Korean tradition, that's celebrated, okay? Any kind of big investment, there's a celebration. And so um, the president of our subsidiary, who had only been in the United States for a few years, had come to to me and, and to a, another gentleman who um, at that time was a public affairs director. I, I took that over, those responsibilities over him and he said, Let's, we need to have a big party. Let's invite uh, Barack Obama to come and to um, over. And so we kind of laughed and said, well, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, this was five years ago. And, and, and my, my colleague, a guy named Bill Cryer, who subsequently retired, said, you know what we ought to do? This is, this is back when we're still mired in the recession. We ought to make a big gift to the community. And we ought to give a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And he had actually been involved um, with United Way. At that time, I had been involved in different um, mm -hmm. community-based organizations, but not in United Way. So we should give it to United Way success by six. I, I didn't know what that meant. 
I didn't know what that, I had no idea. And so what we, th that decision was made. Mm -hmm. He retired and said, good luck with this, Catherine, you know, have fun. <laughs> and so, so we, we made a big, we made a big, we had a big, we had a, uh, the uh, Hilton, we had a big community presentation. We gave a million dollars away. The governor came, it was a big deal. And then I thought, well, that went well. We were on the front page of the newspaper. I thought my job's <laughs> done. You know, we got good PR for the company. Well, um, and well, then uh, the president of, um, of United Way for Greater Austin, Debbie Brzezette, contacted me and said two things. Catherine, I think we'd like for you to come on our board. And I've told this story before. It's really, it, this is very true. And, and I'd like you to, to come and talk to your president about how we're spending your money. So I responded. I said, gee, I feel a little bit like I'm a little overextended. I don't know if I can join your board. And I really didn't think our president cared how we were spending our money, but I thought I shouldn't say that. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> so I said, okay, c come in and, and tell. And so she did, and she made a presentation. In the middle of the meeting, she turned to my boss and said, and we'd like Catherine to come on the board. And I thought, this woman has no boundaries. I mean, what is going on? <laughs> and, but what happened was, is I, and, and, and my, my boss said, yes, you go be on the board. But it, that started my education. And they said, well, you've given all this money to early childhood. You need to go learn about it. And they sent me to a National Business Leader Summit on early childhood. And, and I was like, is, is this true? Is this data right? <laughs> because if this is true, why are we all doing this? Right. You know, the return on investment, the 350, I mean, at some of these national summits, you hear uh, uh, figures much more gaudy than that, you yeah. know? And, and I was just like, wow. And at that meet and at this one summit, um, Charles Butt from HEB sure. was there. And he's a huge, huge Absolutely. advocate for this. And we found out that all over the country, these leader, business leader summits have started. We learned about the children's movement in Florida. And that, well, what are we doing here in, in Texas? Why aren't we all doing this? I mean, it's, it's you know, we spend a ton of money in, 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 in our plant on preventative maintenance. You know, if we have our, we put, we make wafers, right? You know, microchips and go. So we know that the output's not going to be satisfactory. We're not going to have what we call good yield, meaning chips at work, if, if, we, don't, if we don't prime the, the tools. And it takes time, and it's expensive, and so there's a debate, well, how much should we spend on? But it, you don't, you're not going to, you're not going to have, you're not going to have these expensive tools, and you're not going to and invest, you're not going to, you know, if you don't invest in the preventative maintenance, you're going to get, a, you're going to get bad wafers. That's what we call it. Exactly. And it's a great analogy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think it's an, it's an educational point. I think leaders who, who don't, we're not, I mean, we didn't, it wasn't like I, I, didn't, I didn't have an antipathy towards youngsters. I just mm -hmm. didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the big thing is this education. You, you meeting with this middle school, be like, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And then you learn anecdotally, just people saying, you know, the, the, guy, the Larry Elsner runs Open Door locally. Mm -hmm. He talks to the principals where he sends some of their kids, like, oh, we love Open Door kits because we know they're going to be prepared. Well, that anecdotal information is backed up by this this big data that we have. I mean, it's it's true. It says it, and I think business leaders that respond to that, right? Yeah. They want it. You want to you, you want to make good investments, and this is a good investment if it's mm -hmm. if it's quality pre K. Yeah, that's that's a great story. That's that's terrific, and and you're reminding me that that's yet another fabulous group, the United Way, that are champions for Texas kids, and we're so glad to have them working all over the state and here in Austin. Um, uh, Liz, I, here we are, we've got like four sectors represented up here, so we ought to be able to solve some problems, <laughs> right? You know, so I want to kind of just get into that conversation a little bit and ask um, Liz first, you know, what do you really hope the rest of us understand from a research perspective on this issue? What do we really need to know to kind of move forward, you know, on, on this issue of expanding pre-K in Texas? Well, what we've been able to find out from the research is that it's feasible, which is important with interventions. We can do this. Um, it's not terribly expensive per child as an intervention. Um, and it's effective. The research shows, as I had said, very effective. But it depends on having high quality curriculum mm -hmm. in the classroom. That is a really important factor. And teachers who are trained and who are paid well. <laughs> we have to value our preschool teachers like we value other teachers, which we, I wish we valued more and paid more. But uh, preschool and childcare teachers, as you probably know, are paid abysmally low. And in order, if we really do want to make this kind of investment, if we really value it, we need to value the people who are delivering it and pay them well so that we get really good people who are trained in how to work with kids and are passionate about it. We need that. Um, so, you know, and again, that, that Boston program I mentioned, 75% of the people delivering the preschool program have master's degrees. And that's unheard of in, in mm -hmm. most preschools. But that is a great goal to have. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think it's also important to know that you know, we're talking mostly about pre-K, but we've shown in lots of research studies that three-year-olds are benefiting as well. It doesn't, kids don't just start learning when they're four and five. They start learning from birth. So the earlier we can do, the better. And some programs do go to three years old. Uh, Head Start does. Um, early Head Start goes even earlier. So if we can start earlier, we can get an even better bang for our buck if we did that. Um, as I mentioned, several of these uh, evaluations have shown that all kids benefit. It's not just the most at-risk kids. Mm -hmm. um, some of the research I've done with Head Start has shown that it doesn't really matter what skills they come in to the program with, all of the kids benefit. There's a debate about whether um, skill begets skill, or whether you have to have a certain level of skill in order to benefit from the program. Um, Jim Heckman, a Nobel Prize winning economist, who is now a big champion of uh, early education, he has made this argument. But it doesn't seem to be playing out in, in the data, at least in Head Start. What we found is all kids benefit, which is really encouraging. It, it means that if we can afford to give it to all kids, all kids will benefit. Um, it was also important is there was a poll in the, in the fall by Gallup that uh, over 70% of Americans favor using federal dollars for pre uh, universal preschool. So the public is behind it. So we have public support. We just have to find the dollars to do it. Um, I mentioned the cost-benefit analysis done in New Mexico. Um, there's been ranges of how much savings. It depends on how far you follow the kids. The most prominent study was the Perry Preschool study, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. That one has varying numbers. Uh, Jim Heckman finally got it to $7 saved for every $1 spent. And I think that's kind of the number we go with right now. Um, and a lot of that comes from long term. They followed the, the kids until they're in their 40s, looking at uh, savings from welfare, savings from the juvenile justice and criminal justice systems. Mm -hmm. uh, taxes paid by people who are working and can, can, are paying taxes into the system. Um, so we get these very long-term benefits from programs when they follow kids uh, for a very long time. Uh, but even these short-term benefits we're seeing up to kindergarten and preschool, we're seeing benefits again in savings from special ed um, uh, that we would otherwise have to spend. And so the, I guess the last thing that I would say is that I hope that as we think about expanding pre-K in Texas that we encourage the lawmakers to give funding for an evaluation of mm -hmm. whatever we end up doing. Um, these states that have done these evaluations, they've learned a lot. And they've learned a lot about the impact on the kids, on the cost benefit, but then also things that need to be improved. And we won't know that if we don't do a rigorous evaluation. Yeah, so absolutely. I hope that, that as the legislature considers this, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll think about evaluation. Evaluation is not always cheap, but we, otherwise you don't know how your money's being spent. And so it's a pretty crucial thing to know. Yeah, and, and, and I'd love to return, uh, Chairman, to you and have you just share a little bit about what are some of the different um, policy changes that are being considered. I know there are many different bills that have been filed. We don't need to go through every one, but just big picture. Uh, I do believe that there, there are a couple of them which address this issue that Liz has highlighted about the need to evaluate our programs. But what else is on the table? Well, the governor has an initiative, which, which, which I was glad, very happy to hear, and made an emergency item. And Absolutely. I think I have five of his bills that, I'm, that he's asked me to, to move forward uh, mm -hmm. on, in that initiative. And, and they do include evaluation. And they also include teacher certification, mm -hmm. teacher training. We have some dollars being allocated to uh, for choir, uh, for instance, 25% of the teacher's aides to mm -hmm. be, have at least an associate degree and starting to work toward raising that number, but we're using that to start with. And we, we're having stipends for uh, teachers who uh, reach AB and IB, uh, AP and IB uh, rates on their students to give them incentives to, uh, there. So we know that there are incentives that need to be done, and we know that we need to raise the certification and teaching uh, uh, certification in early childhood education. We were really working toward doing that. I think those are the main areas raising the quality of the teachers, understanding that that's very important, mm -hmm. and then trying to allocate the dollars that, that help with that. And we have the Rising Star program in, in, child, in, in, in child care centers, mm -hmm. which we want to keep that funded so that we can get those elevated and get those uh, certified people in the early daycare mm -hmm. or child care centers as well. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do an interim study uh, to look at various programs, as you mentioned, that other states are doing. Mm -hmm so that we can determine here in Texas whether or not we want to have early childhood education under the Texas Education Agency as 
there's a go or have a whole separate agency mm -hmm. uh, like they may have in Georgia and other states to right. deal with early childhood education. We want to take testimony. We want to bring people in from other states where things have right. worked different ways to evaluate how we want to do it in Texas. So it's all some of it's long term. We're not going to solve it all today. Uh, HB4, for instance, is uh, is half day pre K, mm -hmm. but. Uh, we would love to have four-day pre-K, but it's just not realistic that the legislature is going to fund four-day pre-K. We think that they, they will maybe next session. We think that we're moving in that direction, but what's very important to get us there is a lot of input from around the state, from families and centers and uh, agencies that push them. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of sad that the, the legislature wants to see immediate results. Okay. So we don't, we don't get funding for long-range programs. I think if we put the money in early childhood education that we should, it may be 12 years down the line before we see all these dollars saved. Well, they don't, they don't, they don't even understand that. You know, they, they, they want to see something happen today. We can put this money in and we're going to see results and I can go back to my district and show mm -hmm. these results. And so, and, and it's not only in this area, it's in, it's in pre-trial pre, uh, pre diversion, it's in criminal area where you can really lower the, uh, the population in prisons if you put money on the front end into exactly. education and things, but no, they want to see something quick and, mm -hmm. it, and it just doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for sharing those. Catherine, you've heard a few of these. I'm sure you've heard several other suggestions uh, being kicked around. What do you really want our legislators to understand from a business perspective on this issue that might help move the ball forward? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I mean, from a, from a personal standpoint, I'm, I'm the current uh, uh, board chair for United Way for Greater Austin. You know, on a personal level, I see it as an issue of social justice. You know, I mean, it just it just makes you know, you know these, these inequities are not, are not right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if we want to go speak to businesses, I mean, I think I think there's a number of business leaders who feel the similar similar way. But if you want to go you know sell at the Chamber of Commerce, you need to talk in terms of economic development. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that this has really been. I feel like you know from what I can see from these business summits, really being sold. Okay, this, this is an issue of workforce development. Mm -hmm. and, and we all know the antidotes of how much, we're, we're, how much conversation there is about um, you know, workforce readiness for kids graduating from, from high school and so forth, and that there's a crisis, and what are we going to do, and all this thing. Well, again, you know, so we've got to, you know, with the kids, and as, as Jennifer said, kids that we know, the days where the kids just start behind, they stay behind with financial consequences down mm -hmm. the line. So I think that we have to think, that we have to we have to trust data. I mean, but data speaks to business leaders, mm -hmm. okay? And yeah, yes, I mean, if for, maybe for politicians, you need you need you need you need immediate results to sell to constituents. But I think business leaders understand data; they're going to trust it. There's there's an abundance of it, as mm -hmm. as Liz has, has referenced. Um, and and so I think that you you show them data. You talk, you talk in terms of, of of economic development, workforce readiness, um, and 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 we have to be patient. Um, it, it does. We, we, it's, it works. The data, the data is it show that that we're, we're going to get the results we want. And yeah. so um, that's what that's what I think we have to hammer. Absolutely. Well, she says something that, you know that's very important that I have found working with the legislature. If you have an issue you want to get, like we're talking about now, you, you have to appeal to the different interests that people have and I've been able to build you know coalitions because some may want to do it for social reasons some may want to do it for economic reasons mm -hmm. many times those two individuals don't see eye to eye very much and they don't work very well together mm -hmm. but when I try to say look we, we let's look at the end result the end result you both want to see the end result mm -hmm. I don't care why he wants to get there or why she wants to get there I want to get there so I try to pull them together and that's what we have to do we have to be able to work together with and, put, and, and build coalition. Many times, the people who normally don't see eye to eye, mm -hmm. they're both trying to get to the same place. And and so, if his reason for getting there is because it's going to save the state money, mm -hmm. your reason is because it's going to save families. And, and you know, so be it. You both want to get to this point, and that's what and that's when we'll be success, success right. in the, from the legislative 
That's yeah. right. We're going to open it up to audience Q&A in just a minute, but I, I did want to just um, pick up on something that you, uh, that you commented on a little bit already, Chairman, which is, you know, what can we all do? Like everyone in this room is here because they, they believe in Texas kids and they want to do better and expand access to pre-K and do so many other things that Jennifer dared us all to do as the state of Texas. What more, I mean, on a very practical level, what more is needed to help make the case across the street um, for expanded pre-K, you know, whether it's half day this, you know, this time in expanding access or full day, which is where I think we all really want to get to, how can we all help? Well, <clears throat> legislators like cover uh, <laughs> back home. So if you have statewide organizations, the important thing to do is have them visit their, their legislators. Yeah. It really doesn't do... If you live in Austin, it doesn't really do you go good to talk to a Lubbock legislator about mm -hmm. what your needs, if that's not his interest. But you need people back from Lubbock in his office, calling his office and saying, you know, this is important to, to us as constituents of yours. Mm -hmm. Many of them will go with that. I mean, but they want to make sure that they have cover, that they can, somebody's behind them and they're not going to step out on some, in an area that's normally they're not comfortable in. So it's very important, and, and I think that's what got uh, HB5 and the reduction in the stars because we had parents all over the state complaining mm -hmm. to their legislator about all these tests. Mm -hmm. And they came on, they felt comfortable about making changes that they wouldn't have made two years earlier. And so if, you have, if, if this is a passion, you need to, you can't do it this session, but you need a grassroots work throughout the state and your districts where your organization has members mm -hmm and let them and their neighbors contact us. I mean, it really, and it really doesn't do any good from my perspective and I think from our colleagues to get a petition with 10,000 signatures because we know people don't they'll sign anything. Can you sign anything? Mm -hmm. But what really matters is, is, is a call right. from an individual to say, this is important to me from their district mm -hmm. or a handwritten card, not a postcard that's uh, Xeroxed sure. and you know, you're sending 10,000 like uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington and pull them out. That doesn't work for him. So, but personal, personal contact really does influence these members from their constituents. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's terrific. You know, I, I think that's right. Um, you know, in, in addition to being on the, you know, the chair of the United Way board, I, I, I mean, ironically, I also serve on the executive committee of the Chamber of Commerce. And, you know, the truth of the matter is these are, these are well-meaning business people who, from big businesses and small businesses who want their businesses to thrive. And they're rational people. They're going to listen to data. And I think that if you look at what Charles Butt did, now granted his, his success is not, might not necessarily been at the Capitol. Yeah. And he got frustrated with those efforts and went and, and, and drove a local solution in, in San Antonio, Absolutely. which would be very interesting to, to follow. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously as a person with, with a huge reputation, very influential, Mm -hmm. And and I you know, there's other there's other leaders out there that it, it, we see examples in other states where you have CEOs. Mm -hmm. and of course, you, you know it's easier maybe in Vermont. It's really little, you know. <laughs> so you've got a couple of CEOs and they go down this the, the, and, and they, everyone <laughs> listens. To that, you know, we're a huge state, so that yeah. that creates some challenges yeah. um, to to have statewide solutions. But I I do think that you know. It's like I think we need to go. We need to evangelize and sort of convert souls, and I and I mean that not from a moral perspective, just with, a, but just make the case, the business case. The business case is there, and if we bring people in and present them the data in a way that they don't feel like they're bad people, that they don't care about poor children, you know, and there's solutions. I mean, I think that we're all overwhelmed. There's so much need, and as a business, like, well, what? How do we start? Where do we go? You know, it's, you know, because I think it, it's overwhelming and some people just want to stick their head in the sand. Like, I just can't deal with it. I, but when we talk about solutions, and we do it, we obviously have to go to full-day pre-K because who, what, what parent works three hours a day? You know, then where do you put your, where does a child go after pre-K is up? So um, we have to be practical and, um, and look at, you know, the great thing is we can look at successes otherwise, uh, where they've taken place elsewhere, mm -hmm. present business leaders, you know, with somebody, so, and knowing that the school districts are gonna are gonna see a return on their investment, you're not gonna, you know, the school districts aren't gonna fight you. Yeah. I mean, the the school districts are they want this, okay? Um, and so, you know, that, I just think that we we need to we need to we need to put people out, boots on the ground, go in, talk to business leader, convert key business leaders, so they can have these persuasive conversations with their representatives, Absolutely. and then I think we'll have change. It ha it's happened in other states. We have a 
big state with you know, all sorts of different economies around the state. So we have challenges, but it's, I mean, how exciting that it's starting to happen. Yeah, that's you terrific, know? wonderful. Let's open it up for Q&A. We've got uh, just a few minutes for some questions and we've got um, folks with mics in the room. Here we have one up in front. And if you could say uh, who you are too, we'd love to hear. Oh, sorry. Uh, Cynthia Osborne. Yeah. Um, Chairman, you mentioned that uh, one of the um, constraints is that there's long-term payoffs to early investment. And sometimes it's hard to understand what the short-term payoffs would be. I was wondering, Liz, could you speak a little bit to what some of those short-term payoffs really are? Um, you mentioned school ret um, grade retention and so forth. But it really doesn't take 12 years for us mm -hmm. to start seeing some of the payoffs to our systems um, mm -hmm. and at the individual level. Could you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we see obviously very short-term gains in kids' achievement. Um, and so that, I mean, that should be a goal in and of itself, you know, that kids are learning and doing better in school and that's gonna set them on a good path. You can't put a number on that, like a dollar savings on that, but we do see that. Um, there's some studies that have found um, health benefits. Um, and so you can't put numbers on those. Um, we see benefits in kids' social emotional skills, and so their ability to regulate themselves, and also some benefits on kids' attention skills, which is obviously a huge set of skills that will carry them well through school. So um, we do see these kind of short-term benefits for kids. Um, some of them, again, are hard to put numbers on, but they're, they're definitely there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Sharon. No, I mean, the numbers issue is what I was speaking to, because what we... What, what I was referring to and why I said 12 years, we were looking at the prison population, things of that nature. It's gonna take a while, you know, uh, remediation classes in college will go down and all this, and you won't see that for 12 years. And, mm -hmm. But certainly there's short term, for individual kids, there are short term benefits, mm -hmm. certainly for the individual kids. And, <clears throat> but then that was my point, the legislature, they don't look at, at those types of social, uh, uh, benefits. I mean, it, yeah, it's not measurable, and so they don't think that is important, and they don't, they can't get anything out of it. And unfortunately, a lot of the members want to get something out of it. Right. You know. Let's have another question here. Thank you, Krista Delgallo at the Texas Council on Family Violence, and I've spent a lot of time working with and on behalf of poor single mothers and their children that have survived domestic violence, and one of the main job markets for those folks, particularly at an entry level, has been childcare and pre-K, uh, to be teachers in those settings. Uh, and they're, they're largely going in um, with low educations and with not a lot of job skills. So I was, at the same time, extremely thrilled to hear about the idea of providing more training to that sort of section of the job field and raise those um, wages up because in doing so that's not only going to help the kids in those classes it's going to help the kids of the families of those employees but I was also scared when I hear things like and in Boston all of them have masters because I feel like if we set some educational bars it's going to cut out most of the market uh, most of the individuals that are currently in that those jobs right now if we don't just work on bringing them up with the training that they need to succeed as opposed to just setting that bar and then kids fresh out of college are going to get those jobs instead of single moms that are raising three kids by themselves. I'd like to just address that real fast and there's a there's a, and Dr. Aletha Houston is a professor emeritus at University of Texas in early childhood has um, spoken on this as well and there's there's publications about the economic development imp implications of of having uh, pro uh, professionally trained um, pre-K teachers. It's not going to eliminate the opportunities for those individuals. They're going to be complementary to. I mean, if you look in the, in, in the special education realm, right, you have certified special education teachers, and you also have, you know, everyone has, has, has aides who certainly have some level of skill in continuing education, but not necessarily a four-year degree. It's not required. So I, I don't, I think that it's going to expand opportunities for everyone, all right? But the, the, but the truth of the matter is, in, in, as much as we want, we want to give job opportunities for these folks, absolutely. And I think if we expand, if we, if we, if we expand um, early childhood education, we bring in these standards, those, those opportunities aren't going to go away because we're going to want to have certified teachers and then we're going to want to be complemented by age, which th this population would fill. But, but the, the truth of the matter is, 
people who do not have education, you know, are not going to, you know, not going to raise that bar. But you're not going to make, you're not going to meet the quality guidelines. And so we need to, it needs to be complementary. I, so I, I think it, I don't, I, I don't think it's a zero sum game. Okay, I think it's going to be all, all of the above. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, and, and on that end, one of the bills that we have requires initially 25% of the parent age to have at least an associate degree, and we're going to eventually raise that because we don't want to just fire people right. and kick them out, but we do want to, we have to raise the bar. We're not going to change the outcomes. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, their wages are going to go up. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Yeah. So that's going to be an opportunity. So we're almost out of time. Um, I want to just uh, make a few remarks in closing before I thank our fabulous uh, panelists up here and, and, and get you all onto the rest of your day. Um, I have to make a bit of a, a shameless plug here um, for the fabulous, wonderful staff that I have the privilege to work with at CPPP. They are out there every single day. In fact, today we have folks, our fiscal policy experts across the street at the Capitol advocating against major tax cuts that would you know, uh, prevent uh, so many kids and families from getting the public services they need. We have our health care analysts arguing about the devastating impact of further restricting Medicaid uh, and restricting, therefore, um, uh, health care for kids. Every single day we're out there doing research and, uh, and analyzing and developing policy recommendations. Some of you may know that tonight um, starts a big annual event here in Austin called Amplify Austin. It's a philanthropic uh, giving day. It starts tonight and goes all the way through until to, uh, tomorrow, I think, at 5 o'clock. Um, we are, are participating in Amplify Austin, and it is an opportunity to help support the work of the center. You'll notice that in your folders you have this fun little thing that has a beer mug on it. As an extra little incentive in case uh, all the work isn't enough to convince you, we are going to have a very fun party, which we're calling our Beer and Bar Charts Party in April <laughs> for anyone who donates. Um, anything helps. I mean, whether it's $10 or, you know, $25 or $100 or whatever, we would so appreciate if you would support the work of CPPP during Amplify Austin and support all the other great organizations, including those I mentioned earlier and the many more that are represented here. So I wanted to say that. Uh, I wanted to really dearly thank our panelists. Thank you so much for your passion on this issue and for your leadership. And I wanted to thank our sponsors again, Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas for sponsoring the event and the Anna E. Casey Foundation. Um, and we will be posting Jennifer's presentation online. And we hope that you all will fill out your truth or dare cards and work with all of us to dare Texas to be the number one state for kids. Thank you.